Fifteen years ago, a man living in suburban Brisbane called police to report somebody walking the street with a gun. OK, what type of weapons has he got there? Uh, he's, what kind of guns has he He's got a, a, a semi-automatic 22 with a silencer. Pistol. Is it a pistol? No, it's not. But he has got a pistol. Well, what is it? Semi-automatic what, rifle? Oh, I don't know. I've never is thought... it a rifle or pistol? Well, he's got both. He's got a rifle and he's got a pistol. And he's got loads and loads of ammo. We got one shot. Gunshot. No one. Officer down. Get a car there now. Get a car there now. We have an officer down. Three officers, in fact, were shot that night, including Constable Darren uh, Darrell Elliot Green that night in Chermside. Darrell, good evening to you. Good evening, David. Some people have heard your story. They've come across you over particularly the last couple of years because you've turned what was a particularly dark time into something positive. Just remind us, where were you shot? I was shot in the face and I was shot in the shoulder. And what sort of weapon was it? It was a .22 calibre rifle. When you hear that audio, which you have no doubt hundreds of times or plenty of times, what does it make you feel? For me now, listening to that is no problem whatsoever because I've become desensitised to it, which is very, very healthy. A lot of people with a traumatic event, they want to push it away like it never occurred where unfortunately it might be one year it might be 20 years it comes back i sought help very shortly after the shooting i was put through a desensitization treatment and that was in a psychiatrist chair closing my eyes talking my way through the shooting and when i got to the point where i got shot i jolted out of the chair i opened my eyes my memory was so sharp same listening to the audio the more i've listened to it the easier it's become I knew that you talked about it. I knew that you played the audio. That's why we played it. I didn't try to do it too, uh, mm. too, for negative purposes, mm. I assure you. Given the fact that you have talked through that evening as well so many times, remind us, take us back there. What was what was happening and, and what do you remember of the call-out? I was on my second last night of night work and I was going away with my girlfriend up the north coast for a few romantic days together and I was really excited about it. Second last night... It's 3.50 in the morning. We have a threats against the person job. The threats were 14 hours old. So there wasn't an immediate danger. So we commenced our investigation. We were seated in our police vehicle. We were doing background checks. I'm in the back seat listening to the information as some come over a mobile phone and some come over a police radio. We are only going to be there a few minutes. So the side doors open. It's a quiet, Chermside neighbourhood, mm. never been there, no it's around, problem. It's around four in the morning and it is 350 precisely. It's, it's, it's not really a time that you're going to expect much, uh, much traffic. And what do I hear coming from my left-hand side? I hear this pat, pat, pat. And I thought, what could that possibly be? And what came to my imagination? Oh, that's probably a neighbour's dog running up to the car. So I've just nonchalantly turned and looked and it's a man standing there pointing at my face, a point two two caliber rifle. Do you remember any reaction at all from yourself? One moment I'm looking towards this man, the next moment my head is flung over onto my side, my hands around my mouth, there's blood, there's teeth, there's bone. I didn't even realise the, the second shot that I felt in the arm. I, I didn't actually feel any pain whatsoever. It was so sudden. And the very concept of being able to translate what you had seen at that moment, as you said, particularly just going through the list of what was being sent through to you on the phone, uh, maybe there might be a dog somewhere, that the idea of processing that information from from the moment where nothing was wrong at all to the moment where everything was wrong, how long did it take you to, to connect it? Do you remember making the connections as to what's happened? Initially, I was just in, in shock. I knew something very bad had happened. I've sat up, the sergeant's seat's empty, my partner's, she's splattered with blood. It was deathly silent. It wasn't, in fact, though, but I was suffering audio exclusion. I yelled to my partner, get help, 
and I took my firearm out and I had to go out through the door that I'd actually been shot through because the other door had the child safety locks on. Then I, it didn't take me too long. I just snapped. I went into fight mode and I went looking for the offender. So literally, I've just been shot through that door. I might climb out that door and see what's waiting for me out there. I tried to open the opposite door, couldn't get out. So I had no choice to go out through that door and see what was there. And he wasn't there, the offender. I went into fight mode. I yelled out at him, but I soon realized that I didn't know where my sergeant was. So I started to walk down the street yelling out, Chris, Chris, Chris. Then I come across a person in the street and they've yelled out, don't shoot, which has helped me identify this is a middle-aged lady, likely not the shooter. I gave her a direction to move back in the house. Probably not the the best client service at the time, given the circumstances. Could she see your face? I mean, the idea of, you mentioned the fact that you were shot effectively through the face. If someone was standing anywhere near you, even with a little bit of light around, might have been able to see something was very wrong. Yes, the uh, blood on, on my shirt. And there was a neighbour who looked out and we had one of the statements that they saw me going down the street and then coming back and then the you know blood that was pulled over my shirt. And then when I couldn't find Chris and I've sent her and then her husband back into the houses, I've come back and I'm looking at my partner through the windshield and she says, oh, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. And there's a gunman on the loose. She's nearly paralysed from all, all the rounds that she's taken. I'm trying to hold my mouth together, lean on the bonnet to support myself, and I'm saying, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. And she's thinking, you don't see yourself, you're pouring <laughs> blood all over the bonnet. It's not a very yeah. reassuring sight, there's Greeny. A, there's a time for bra- bravado, and uh, there's a time when you can see through it. Yeah. You mentioned the fact that she too had taken a, a number mm. of rounds. How many times was she shot? Approximately eight times. Was she able to move? When the first vehicle arrived at the scene, I've gone to meet that first vehicle. My partner's gone to get out the vehicle, but she was so badly and she slumped in the gutter. Do you see that in your mind? Do you see that? Oh, it's crystal clear. The events of that night, the operations, the the news when I've got the surgeon had sat me down who was inspecting the first reconstruction said, Daryl, you were sat in my dentist chair. There's no way you can clean what's in your mouth. Uh, because uh, there's no way that I can clean it whilst you're in my dentist chair. I'm sorry, your reconstructions failed. So if you have a memory with a very strong emotion attached to it, you remember it very, very clearly. So that entire night, subsequent events over the the period, very sharp. Because some people often speak about events that are particularly traumatic or particularly confronting as uh, being blocked out. Is that something that you've come across with speaking to, to other people? I've had found more the opposite. People with very mm. clear memories, be it Vietnam veterans who've had to you know, kill people in combat, bury bodies. Mm. So I think that's from my experience of people that they've blocked it out. It may be just subconsciously. It is there, but it was so painful, so traumatic, they blocked blocked it out. For those who don't know the story, what happened to your sergeant and what happened to your partner? My, my partner, uh, she, uh, she, the first ambulance came and they couldn't see my partner because, because of her position behind, beside the police vehicle. So I've, they've coming towards me and I've actually waved the, my arm for them to go to her because I was so concerned that uh, she may not live. So they've gone uh, to my partner, they've patted her, her down for her injuries, they put her on a Guernsey, put her in the back of the ambulance, and one of the other officers has said to another female constable, Kylie, go with Chanel, uh, keep her company. Uh, Sergeant, uh, he'd seen me scream and saw me just go vertically in an instant, sorry, horizontal in an instant, and thought I was dead. He's exited the vehicle, he's looked over his shoulder, he saw a fair-headed person, he did not know if it was me or the offender, so he said, I couldn't take the shot. If I killed you, I'd be a villain. If I killed the offender, I'd be decorated. So he's moved to the other side of the street looking to find cover, and he's got shot again. 
and he was able to, and it shows you what you can do under a, adrenaline, two bullets in him, came to a six foot chain mail fence, threw his revolver over, took his hands on top, somersaulted over, over that fence, got to a house with a light on, banged on the door and got entry, got on the phone and, and got help coming our way. On ABC Local Radio Queensland, Daryl Green is our guest. You might have come across him before. He was a police officer, one of three that night in suburban Brisbane, who was shot by a man roaming the streets, both with a rifle and with a pistol. We understand the idea of police work being dangerous, but the idea of it just happening out of nowhere. Had you ever thought about that as a, as a possible occurrence? Had you come across other officers who'd been shot? Up to that time, I had not come across other officers. And if I'd followed a little bit of advice from my father, this probably wouldn't have happened. When I was 18 and I wanted to do something exciting, interesting, you know, involve fitness, like the police, my dad said, oh, I wouldn't mind if you joined the federal police because you wouldn't have to go to those domestics or those disturbances where these crazy events can occur. And I thought, what's the chances of that happening? About the chances of winning a lottery. So, yes, it's amazing how many things your dad tell us tells you that um, later on in life turn out to be all right. Do you remember the next couple of days? Because the idea of what happened to you was was shocking. And initially, as you said, you would be in shock. After a while, pain would set in. After a while, realization would set in. Your parents would have to be told. Your girlfriend would be told, not just. The fact that she was missing out on time up the coast, but also what had happened. And initially, the first few weeks after the shooting, I was stunned, dazed, and my thoughts were a little bit fuzzy. But in fact, I was actually walking along the edge of a cliff. An event was about to occur that was going to nudge me over that cliff. Seven weeks later, a senior constable, Norm Watt from the dog squad in Rockhampton, attended a domestic violence incident. He was shot once. He was shot in the leg and cut his femoral artery. You cut that artery, if that artery is not sealed within four minutes, you bleed to death. Norm unfortunately died being shot once. We were all shot multiple times and lived. And I think my subconscious has looked at my own mortality and I just went into a free fall into full-blown post-traumatic stress, anxiety, anger, depression. It was a very dark time. Particularly in something like that, almost a bit of survivor's guilt. Not many people survive being shot in the face. No, and I've been told that, that if it wasn't for a few instances of subsonic ammunition, sawn off, etc., that there's a very... Pretty much, I'd be dead, Sharnell would be dead, and, and the sergeant would be very sore. You mentioned the fact that it took an incident a number of weeks later. What was the recovery process like in the in the police force? Was there much uh, discussion about what was going to happen, about what you would be doing? We have a very good support network in the police that, that are psychologists employed by the police. And I was very fortunate to have a man named Chris Mankelo, who was one of these, and he was a Vietnam veteran and he'd been blown up by a booby trap and all that I was suffering, he'd suffered. So here I was being able to talk to by an expert who'd walked the same path but many years before and come out the other side. So I was very grateful. What about before when you were training, when you were at the academy? As you said, your, your dad had a couple of words to you saying maybe try something different. What about um, when it comes to, to police training? Do they say to you, be prepared, this could happen? When I went through the academy to give us an idea about critical instances, we were told of a few instances, a few reactions, the psychological reactions, and there was also one classic incident in America, the FBI murders, that they played a, a segment of, of that just to demonstrate that how many times somebody can be shot and, and keep on going. I did not speak to any... Well, did not have any officers to speak to to say this is what occurred and this is the process and and post-traumatic stress is actually a normal reaction to an abnormal event where I now do a lot of speaking and started out speaking to recruits at the academy on this and can say this is what you are people mm. have been going for this for thousands of years 
and we know more and more and more about it and there's new therapies coming along all the time to assist. Coming up to six minutes to eight on ABC Local Radio Queensland, Daryl Green is my guest on ABC Local Radio. We're talking about uh, his experience. It was 15 years ago initially when this happened Mm -hmm. to you, Daryl, but the process continued to be ongoing, didn't it? I mean, when you talk about post-traumatic stress, different people, it affects different ways. How did it continue to to affect your life and, I suppose, your career? The operations did interfere with my life and it would bring back all the effects of post-traumatic stress. The the medical operations, as in surgery? Yes, yes. How many did you need? I had two facial reconstructions and a combined total of 17 general anaesthetics. It was a significant trauma itself, the reconstruction. So that would come back from those times. But I also had some issues, and these are the lessons I now love sharing with people. I had a fear of confrontations, fear of uh, firearms, and I said, you know what? I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to become a firearms instructor. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. What was the response of the police force when you said to them, I've been shot, I have a trouble with firearms, I might teach other people about them? I spoke to my inspector at the time about that and he supported me in challenging myself and I had a very good support network during the training. There was one officer who'd been involved in a fatal shooting and... There was excellent support, as well as saying, you know, good on you for, for not giving up and, and to keep on going. And it was soul restoring to be able to do that, come out the other side, be a firearms instructor and overcome your fears. And I love talking to audiences and say, hey, it won't be easy, but it's going to be worth it. It's interesting to hear because there are some people who take decisions like that and it goes the other way. The idea of trying to confront something which is so bad instead of doing it um, verbally and emotionally and, and talking it through the idea of physically confronting that which scares you most, it can go either way. Did you have support? Did you obviously speaking to people at the time about what it would do and continue to speak to them as you went through it? I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time who was fully supportive and I had a, a lot of support mechanisms and one of the things was exercise. Another thing was visualisation. Another thing was that Sometimes I did have an overreaction to scenarios, and you know, guess what we did? We always finished on a high. We'd come back, we'd get the scenario right, and then I'd embed the proper training. So I was incredibly grateful for the opportunity that I was given, and it was just a soul restoring. It just yeah. sim- simply was. When did you take the decision to not just teach other people about firearms, to help them in their knowledge and to help you in your concerns as they were, but to take that broader and to actually try to help others through their problems? Well, 2006, I spoke at at the academy. I was asked to speak to recruits that might have some lessons. In 2010, I got invited to a district officer conference at Charleville and spoke on those lessons. And I met somebody in 2014. He turned out to be a, a speaking coach. And he said, you've got an amazing story. He knew I couldn't afford his fees, but he started to work with me for free. I learned of an opportunity I applied for this opportunity and and after 15 years of horrible, sad, painful news directly related from the shooting, I was able to bring a little piece of golden news to my 81-year-old mum and 83-year-old dad who'd seen me through all the torment. I was awarded the by the Professional Speakers of Australia who gather once a year to recognise an emerging speaker, the Kerry Nan Scholarship for Public Speaking. So since the beginning of this year, my speaking ability lessons, even like my website, twiceshot.com, the website company who who did that, the the graphics, but learning about turning those lessons, making them valuable to other people is very enriching for me. You talk in those talks a lot about things like resilience. What does that look like to you? Quite simply, resilience is not strength. Resilience is returning the strength because there was there is going to be things, it doesn't matter who you are, will knock you down. And it could be a death of a spouse. It could be a redundancy at work, but it's about picking yourself up. And this is the one 
powerful lesson I'd like to share with the audience tonight. We will all go through adversity, trauma. Sometimes it might seem hopeless. Have a plan. Then something might change and you might need to change the plan. And then there might be another catastrophe. You might need a new plan. But if you've got a plan, you've got hope and that will see you through to the other side. Is it hard to cut through sometimes if somebody's going through this, if somebody themselves are depressed? Do you, do you find it hard sometimes? Not particularly because I can understand where I've, I've had great support and, and friends who've suffered depression and so I was able to talk to them. And so the number one thing I, I say to them, and you might not be able to see it now, you know, may not be able to feel it, but believe me, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Just give it the time, do the healthy things. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Turn to alcohol or drugs or ignore your problems. Take positive action and it won't be easy. It'll be worth it. It might be a long journey, but here I am now. I travel the state. I've spoken internationally and so I've turned a negative to a positive. My mum and dad love it and <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great ambassador for the police. I, I love explaining yeah. to people about aspects of policing. Wonderful. Able to be uh, supporting both his mum and dad and giving them the joy. Daryl Green, thank you so much for your time tonight. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. If you would like to know any more about that, if you'd perhaps like a little assistance yourself, maybe you can uh, get onto Daryl's website, as he mentioned. It is twashot.com here on ABC Local Radio Queensland.